Welcome everybody. This is Brenda Platt with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. This webinar today is featuring two business models for community composting. One is work -owned, a worker-owned cooperative and the other a social enterprise. Uh, we see that we have uh, many attendees logging on right now, so we're going to wait a few minutes uh, for a little bit more of a critical mass to get started. So thank you for your patience. Again, welcome to the webinar today. This is a webinar on two business models for community composting. Uh, my name is Brenda Platt. I'll be facilitating uh, the webinar today. We're going to get started in just another minute or two. We're going to give a few more people to log on and be able to participate. So thank you for your patience. All right, again, this is Brenda Platt with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Welcome to the webinar today. We are going to get started now. Um, I see that more people are joining, but um, this uh, webinar is two business models for community composting, one on a worker-owned cooperative and another on a social enterprise. Um, we're going to um, start with a few polling questions to get a sense of who's participating. So, um, Nick, who is going to be uh, tech support on the webinar today will be leading the polling questions. So who's on the line? Please select all that apply. You can select more than one. Um, government, nonprofit, private business, community composter, an urban farm, community garden. We realize that um, there may be another category, but we were somewhat limited. All right, can you show the results, Nick? All right, nonprofit, 48%, 20, one fifth government, community composters, good, almost half, and one fifth urban farm community gardens. Well, welcome, everybody. All right, Nick, next question. So, from where are you in the country? Sorry if you don't feel represented. Again, we were limited to five polling questions, so we tried to cover the US and then if anybody is international. So pick the closest to you. Okay, let's see the results. East Coast, well, rep oh, we need to do some better outreach in the Southwest, okay. And internationally, we didn't really do too much outreach but good representation on the East Coast. Interesting. All right. At least we can say the East Coast participants log on early. Um, so we'd like to know if you're currently operating a community composting enterprise or on the line because you're interested in starting an enterprise and other if you're just listening in. Okay, let's see the results. 30% already operating, more than half interested. Okay, very good. Is that the last poll? Um, okay, I think this is our last question. We're, we're going to do some wrap-up questions at the end, so we hope you'll stay to the end. So select, we want to get a sense for current operators, only if you're currently operating a um, community composting operation, whether you're a collector as well, whether you're for-profit, whether you're a non-profit, if you're also collecting, uh, if you're not collecting, 
uh, you can do all that supply, you can be a collector and a composter, and then we're interested to know whether you're already a worker-owned cooperative or a social enterprise. And the results. Okay, almost two-thirds are collecting, for-profit one-third, non-profit a little bit more, high percentage of, of uh, composters on the line, and I, wow, one, more than one-fifth, almost a quarter, are already a worker-owned cooperative or social enterprise. Very interesting. All right, well, welcome, everybody. Um, so, uh, Nick, that I assume was the last polling question, unless another one pops up. So before we get started, I'm just going to say a few words about the uh, Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Uh, for those of you who, uh, who aren't familiar with us, we're a 43-year-old national nonprofit promoting healthy communities through local economic development. We work in some pivotal sectors. Some of these are listed here, energy, waste, broadband, retail, banking. Uh, essentially, we fight corporate concentration and are about keeping economic power local. That's a common thread among our initiatives. And building community equity has been part of our mission since we were founded in 1974. Now, I head up our Composting for Community initiative. And like our other initiatives, we provide a vision of the opportunities, tools. We offer a menu of policies to achieve that vision. We've written a lot of reports. Some of these are here, including um, Growing Local Fertility, a, a guide to community composting. They're all available for free uh, for download on our website. But we also offer a compost training, in particular, uh, our Neighborhood Soil Rebuilders Composter Training Program, which we launched in 2014, is specifically a training program to help spur well-operated community composting uh, programs and sites. And we uh, have replicated this in Atlanta, Baltimore, and in the DC, Maryland area. Happy to bring it to your town. We are particularly interested in cultivating community composting. We have held some national forums on community composting in conjunction with the US Composting Council Conference as well as BioCycle. And I'm pleased to share that we are currently planning our fifth one in Atlanta in January. So if you're interested in participating or sponsoring that event, uh, please contact us at the email provided here, composting for community at ilsr.org. And we have also established again this year a scholarship fund to help offset community composters uh, travel and accommodation registration fees. So do send us an email if you're not already on our list um, to get plugged into that. And we also have um, a Google group and a listserv form. So we'd love to kind of build the uh, community um, network and movement. So please join. Um, one, um, one of the other things that we have also offered is a series of infographics and posters. And I think the one that's relevant to today's uh, conversation is this new food scrap hierarchy we've developed. It Prevent, it prioritized preventing food waste in the first place, similar to the US EPAs that uh, many of you may be familiar with, and rescuing edible food to feed people and animals. But then I think the lens is a little different. It promotes locally based and small scale systems before centralized ones. And we think scale and issues of place really matter. And that's one reason we're sponsoring this um, webinar today and helping to facilitate the community composting movement and uh, infrastructure. So today we're really focusing on this kind of uh, community-based composting, which is essentially you know, the radical idea that compost is used within the same community where the material is generated and that the community participates in some way. Now, in talking to a lot of community composters out there, including many of you, uh, some of the hot topics that have been identified to us you know, around the country are more information on business models, planning, and financing. So that was the impetus for this today's uh, webinar subject matter. So I'm very pleased to introduce our two speakers today. Eric Lombardi is the president of Zero Waste Strategies, Inc., and is the former executive director of EcoCycle in Boulder. Laura Holmes is the general manager and business development lead for Zero Cooperative in Roxbury, Massachusetts. Now, Eric 
has been, I'm going to introduce both speakers now. Eric has been working at the cutting edge of the zero waste and social enterprise movements across the world since the mid-1990s. When our paths first crossed in the 90s, we were both on the board of the National Recycling Coalition at that time. Eric was the executive director of EcoCycle, which is a mission-driven nonprofit founded in 1976, and he really grew it into a successful social enterprise that uses the revenues to build uh, zero-based uh, communities. And his social enterprise model, while Eco, you know, Eco Cities is primarily focused on recycling, we're going to have him present on, on, on what that model is and how it might be adapted to the community composting business model. Now, Laura, I've known for about three years. In addition to being Zero's general manager, she started other micro enterprises. She's worked with immigrant communities. In uh, less than her first year with Zero, she helped um, raise over $350 thousand dollars via a crowdsource funding campaign to launch its worker-owned food scrap collection enterprise in 2012. So today we're going to hear about those two models, the worker-owned cooperative from Zero and the social enterprise uh, from Eric at EcoCycle, and why a startup might choose to structure in these ways, and hopefully they'll cover some tips on how to get started. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have questions throughout the webinar, feel free to type them into the chat box or the question box. And um, if they're uh, directed at uh, one of our speakers, Eric or Laura, you know, indicate that, that'll help me. If we have time, we'll take questions after Eric's, but generally we're going to hold the questions to the end. All right, so Eric, you're on. Welcome. Thank you, Brenda, and it's always an honor to work with you and the Institute on this stuff. I'm going to assume that my voice is coming through loud and clear. Let me know if it's not. Uh, my screen, great. okay, good. Um, okay, there's my presentation. Thank you. The screen's been jumping around here on me. Uh, still jumping around. Okay, next slide. Uh, Nick, I'm going to say next when I want you to move it forward. Um, so really, really briefly, EcoCycle's been around 41 years. Um, I took it over in 1989 when it was really floundering, and I decided to run it like a business. And at that time, the term, the phrase social enterprise didn't exist. Uh, I grew it to 70 employees, 5 million a year throughput, very, very diverse uh, recycling program. Uh, and we grew it into a zero waste program where we were doing uh, re traditional recycling, non-traditional recycling, composting. We're in the schools. We're, we're everywhere. So uh, we really grew a large organization that challenged the whole traditional waste industry. Next. Um, so other than just doing EcoCycle, and this is where I get to work with Brenda a lot, and it was really a lot of fun, uh, Brenda and I were part of the group that co-founded the first zero waste organization in the U.S., uh, then also part of the, I co-founded the first international zero waste organization out of Wales in 2002, um, invited to the White House, been consulting around the world, and the only reason I'm showing you all this is to let you know that I have worked with and participated in a lot of different approaches to uh, zero waste, waste management, and all this other stuff. And what I'm going to talk about today is sort of my new passion about how we get stuff done. It's not as much a technical issue as it is an economic and political issue. Uh, so, and business fascinates me. So, next. So the context today, for me, I'm talking about business. Um, I know that, you know, you guys are all wonderful. We all know composting is wonderful. It's really cool and groovy. That's how recycling was born. That's, we're doing it because it's the right thing to do. Uh, but what I'm going to talk to you about today is how do you make it happen business-wise because that's really how we can grow this thing. Um, so first thing we have to realize is the free market is not handling this opportunity, and there's reasons for that. It's low profit. Yes, there are high barriers to entry, and there's limited demand for the service. So you really got to ask yourself, why are you getting into this? Because it is not going to be an easy uh, swim. So let's talk about that. And we're going to talk about why the market's not handling it. Next. Your reasons for getting into this is very appealing to a lot of people. They may not know it yet. So your job is to help them understand. But in order for you to do something in the business world that the free market is not already doing, 
you're going to need those people that share your vision and philosophy about society and life. And so this is very much part of where we're going forward here. Social enterprise is not business as usual. It's business with a purpose. And the purpose is where we bring in people, we bring in localities, and we bring in vision and philosophy. Next. So I was inspired early on by Paul Hawken, The Ecology of Commerce, great book. I highly recommend you all read this because Paul really nailed it when he said, we don't have to save the earth, we have to save the business world because it's the way the business are killing the earth. And I, I often told my community, if you believe that, if you understand that statement right there, then you're going to be open to whole new ways of doing business. And that's what social enterprise is. It's a new way of doing business. Next. So there's this thing called social enterprise. And there's a lot of confusion over what it is. We don't have a good standard definition yet. Some of it is legal. Some of it's not legal. Uh, I'm involved in the international discussion around this stuff. Social enterprise in the U.S. is actually lagging behind the rest of the world. Um, this Sunday, I'm flying off to New Zealand to speak at the International Solar, uh, Social Enterprise Conference. It's called the Social Enterprise World Forum. It happens every year, usually in September. Uh, this year in New Zealand, there'll be 1,200 people, 14 of us from the United States. So there is something happening out there that is way beyond what's happening within the United States. Um, so basically, Social enterprise, first of all, understand it's a business platform. It's not a person like the social entrepreneur. One of the reasons I think the social enterprise platform has lagged in the U.S. is because we're so enamored with the heroic individual in America that we hold up the social entrepreneur as the model. And that's fine. I got nothing against social entrepreneurs. In fact, it's usually social entrepreneurs that start social enterprises. But what's important is social enterprise is a business structure and it's hopefully going to become a legal structure so that it doesn't take a heroic person to run one. <laughs> We're going to standardize um, social enterprise in such a way that normal people can build and run one. Um, the UK estimates it has 80,000 social enterprises at this point. It's growing fantastically in Australia, South Korea, Canada, all over Africa. We don't know how many we have in the U.S. We do have a social enterprise alliance in this country. It's over 15 years old. I've participated with it. But it's very much grounded in the nonprofit model. And in America, nonprofits have been threatened by the social enterprises. And that's something we need to overcome. Um, so, next. So, it is growing to the extent, like I said, the UK is leading on this, especially Scotland. But this is pretty profound what the UK Department of International Development did. They're going to end their traditional aid program to India because they're finding out that social enterprise is so much more powerful than just charity, than just handing out money. And there's really, and that's starting to happen all over Africa as well. And um, Scotland sees such potential in this. They're going for 20% of their GMP by 2025. And the Royal Bank of Scotland, the biggest bank in Scotland, is totally financing the social enterprise economy in Scotland because they get it. It's deal flow as far as the bank is concerned. And finally, Bill Gates Foundation created a fund. Um, uh, uh, first, it was $100 million to um, invest in social enterprises through this program called Program Related Investments, which I can talk about more in a minute. But he is up to a billion dollars now. He really believes that rather than just handing money out to people, they want to invest in these ongoing concerns and that uh, the social enterprise business model is long-lasting and self-supporting. Next. So I, I mentioned the Royal Bank of Scotland. This is what the CEO said when I was at the first World Social Enterprise Forum in Scotland. And it really, really made sense that uh, the key line here is that we've got major social and environmental problems that the government can't fix, the market won't fix, and charity is a band-aid. And basically what that CEO said was, we need a new way forward, and it's called social enterprise. Next. So 
So here's the British Council's definition of social enterprise. It's a business that trades to tackle social problems, improve communities, people's life chances, I like that one a lot, or the environment. They make money from selling goods and services, and they reinvest their profits back into the business or the local community. So it's, it's business for the purpose. It's a double bottom line. Instead of a single bottom line, they're pursuing profit. Social enterprises pursue a purpose, and they're expected to make profit to support it. Next. You can think of it this way because a lot of people have a hard time putting their heads around it. A traditional enterprise, they exist single bottom line. Social enterprise has two. And that's the, that's the difference. And the key difference is why was the enterprise created? Was it created to make money or was it created to make compost or recycle or fulfill some social environmental mission? What's the reason that the entity was created? Next. Now, I've been talking about this stuff for a long time, and I teach at business schools, and, you know, in America, everybody wants the free market to solve our problems. And so the last 15 years, we've seen a whole lot of talk around conscious capitalism, new capitalism, green capitalism, sustainable capitalism. You know, you can, you can try to twist capitalism any way you want. Next. But it, in my opinion, capitalism is capitalism. And it's one of the most powerful, possibly beneficial, definitely destructive forces at work on the planet today. You can put socially responsible on it, and it isn't going to work. You can do the sustainable part, and it's only going to be partially successful. I think it's really important that we understand free market capitalism is this amazing thing that we're just not going to change. And so let's leave it alone and let's create an alternative institution as Buckminster Fuller recommended to us. Next. I think what we want to do is rather than mess with capitalism, we're going to mess with the marketplace. So instead of a, the whole world being a single bottom line commercial environment, we have an opportunity to carve a piece of that economic activity out for double bottom line activities. And that's our goal, is that we think that there's a way to do business that the purpose of doing that business is, you know, community composting. It's recycling. It's clean water. It's education, job training. It's all these social needs or environmental needs. That's the purpose for having the activity. And at the same time, profit can be made uh, to support that activity. So we're talking about carving a piece of the market out for a new way of doing business. And this is pretty revolutionary. And a lot of people push against this and say, no, you, you know, you can't mess with it that way. Capitalism is capitalism and business is business. But we're standing up saying, no, we can mess with it. We can actually do business for a purpose and not primarily for profit. And so how are we going to carve a piece of the market out? Next. We're going to get people to understand, primarily, traditionally, there's three ways things get done in the world, government, business, or nonprofits. Those are kind of the three major sectors that make anything happen in your community. What we're saying is there's a, we're giving birth to a fourth sector, and it's a hybrid sector. It's a sector that's taking pieces of business partnering with government and the, and the charity mission part of the nonprofits. It's bringing that all together in one organization. And in all these different hybrid models, um, worker-owned cooperatives is part of the hybrid, part of the force sector. And there's, we're in a very creative uh, process at this point, creating the force sector. Next. Some of it's starting to get legal, legalized. And I think that's really important um, because if you're not legal, if you don't have boundaries, if you really don't define who you are and, and you basically are, are anything, if you're everything, you're nothing. And so we, we're in the process right now of legalizing ourselves. Uh, the UK has made social enterprises a legal entity called the CIC. Uh, the US has one called the L3C, the Low Profit Limited Liability Company. 
Canada has the C3, Community Contribution Company, but this is very much, we're very much at the beginning right now of how, where this thing is going to go. But I think it's important we get legal, and I'll show you in a minute how come it's important that we tighten it up. Next. So how are we going to grow? How are we going to get a piece of the market out? Well, in the UK, they did something very significant in 2013. They passed a law that all government uh, RFPs and contracting for services has got to ask for social, economic, and environmental benefit in any proposal from the private sector. And you get points for what your social value is. So now all of a sudden, people who want to do good in the world, you're going to get points over that, the company that only has one bottom line. They call it value for money. This is a big concept. And what's really exciting is it encourages the government staff basically to talk to their local market providers to design better services, not just cheaper, but better services for the government for the tax dollars. The Social Value Act, you know, they're, they're struggling in England because this is a big revolution. How much money the government spends over there is huge. And in the United States, the federal government is the largest purchaser of goods and services in our economy. So if we were to get something like this in the U.S., it would be a huge opportunity uh, for social enterprise and people like us to grow. Next. So how to grow it in the, in the U.S. Now I'm going to get specific really quickly for, for community composting project. The L3C combined with a PRI fulfill an expanded definition of vital community service. Let me explain both, all of that. Next. So the L3C is a, it's a LLC. It's a limited liability company, which I'm not going to go into deeply. Um, but you need to understand that LLC is a very creative way to form a business because you have members. And each member can buy in at a different level. I can be a member and put in $1.00. Another member can put in a million dollars, and as long as the group agrees, you know, you can create the club you want, the business club you want. And uh, the, the extra L here is low profit. The company is set up to fulfill, just to pursue low profit, um, and it's created to fulfill a social and environmental purpose. And basically, you can incorporate the, or you can create this kind of company in eight states at this point. And the latest survey, there's 1,500 of L3Cs in the USA. Um, and what's so what's important here is if you form an L3C, then your incorporation of the LLC legal entity states your purpose for being in a legal way. Next. Program-related investments, it's an interesting thing in the United States where the IRS requires all foundations to spend at least 5% of their money every year. Right now, that's about $30 billion. And uh, what's neat about PRIs is that a foundation can give you a million-dollar loan or a million-dollar investment, uh, and it counts towards their 5%, even though they're going to get that million bucks back in the future. So this has been around for 20, over 20 years. It's just been very complicated, and not a lot of foundations have done it in the past, but that's changing. There's new rules, and the, L the L3C was specifically created by a foundation director to make it to streamline the PRI, fun PRI funding approach. So I think you end up with a private sector business, the L3C, able to access foundation money, private sector money, or um, private sector accessing foundation money, and the IRS approves it. This is a huge opportunity. Next. And then vital community service, like here in Boulder, uh, well, look at your electric system in your town. Um, basically, we have community utility monopolies. They're guaranteed a profit as long as they provide safe, secure, reliable electric service. This has been going on for 100 years. And I think when it comes to community composting, when it comes to recycling and zero waste programs, I think we need to expand our concepts now for commun vital community services to include climate safe. And as soon as we do that, then we have sort of a justification uh, for the government getting involved in private sector double bottom line activities. Let me give you an example. Next. So this is a community composting facility, theoretical. Every town needs one. We'll say it costs a million bucks 
maybe more or less. Um, so the idea is your group has all the expertise and the vision and the technical know-how, and you just need money. So 60% of that million dollars comes from the PRI. That's a zero interest loan from the foundation or investment from the foundation. And then the next level of investment can come from your philanthropic local rich people. It's called slow money. They'll take a 4% return. And your last 20% is market competitive uh, at 8%. So all of a sudden you have an ability to raise money that you never have ability to raise before. Um, but it's important that you want to make sure that the voting structure of the LLC retains with you. You maintain 51% of voting structure when you create your company, and these people get votes, but they get less votes. Uh, and one of the key ideas here is that the government contribution is not financial. The government steps in to give you land and facilities and also create supply and demand for the compost. And what's nice about this is when you start getting government money, you start really opening up a, a nest of problems. Uh, but this government often has land and facilities, um, and they can pass regulations about supply and demand for compost. So here's a whole package for how you can go forward with a social enterprise, getting different funding sources, partnering with the government in a way that the government's not going to be problematic for you. Uh, and you maintain control as the the mission-driven group that you are to pursue community composting, uh, you always have the power. So this sort of package has an opportunity to move forward. Next. So wrapping it up, there's lots of opportunities to build a zero-waste world using this approach. Um, but I want to just warn you about this government involvement, which I just talked about. The professionalization of the public servant you know, I just did a Google search recently on this, and I got one hit. I, I challenge anybody to ever search Google and get one hit. Um, the one hit was Africa. They want to professionalize public servants in Africa, of course. But for us, the problem is is that the United States public servants are not experts in business. They're not experts in compost. And when they start giving you money, they start stepping in. Out, they, they start overstepping their appropriate role and telling you how to behave, how to do your business, or how to do your composting, and instead of being a support, they're actually a barrier. Um, this is a huge issue. I could run a whole half an hour seminar just on this topic, but I just want to warn you, and that's why I'm encouraging you, if you can grow or establish your project without taking money from the government, but you still want to partner with them so that they pass regulations and give you land and facilities, uh, I think that's the way to go forward. Next. So here are some more information sources. The Social Enterprise World Forum happens every year around the world. I highly recommend people pay attention to next year, next September in Scotland, Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, and then we've got Community Enterprises Scotland, U.S. Social Enterprise. Intersector Partners is a consulting firm here in Colorado. They're specialists in L3Cs. I would contact them if you're interested in setting an L3C up to do your project. Uh, or email me directly, and we can discuss, you know, how the social enterprise approach could work for you. And I think that's it. All right, great, Eric. Thank you so much. I already have numerous questions myself, but we're going to hold questions till the end. And uh, Laura, uh, unmute yourself and get ready to speak. And for those who joined uh, after I already introduced Laura, Laura is the general manager for CIRO, which is a worker-owned cooperative, um, community composting cooperative in the Roxbury, Boston area. So she is going to share with us the worker-owned cooperative business model and how that's working for Zero. So Laura, welcome. Hey, thank you, Brenda. Thanks, hey. uh, everybody, for taking time on your day. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound great. Great. Cool, cool. And thank you to everybody at the uh, uh, Institute for, for hosting this webinar today. It sounds like there's a lot of really experienced, knowledgeable folks out there already and um, I'm sure I could learn a ton from you I look forward to more and more conversations like this it's exciting to listen to you also Eric and hear that more and more I think uh, there are incubators 
of a variety of kinds, but um, sharing this vision that uh, we've got to we've got to throw out a lot of stuff. I would say, including capitalism. But in the meantime, we've got to figure out how to develop what some people call a transition economy, what some people call a new new economy, what we often call around here a solidarity economy. Um, and and I think we're also going from from Eric to me. We're also going to take this a little bit from the the macro uh, to the micro practice here on the ground in in Roxbury. Uh, low-income community of color in Boston. Um, in 2012, a couple dozen workers started talking to each other. They were also activists. Uh, about half of them were involved with a local immigrant workers center. Um, about the other half of them were involved in an African-American-led um, Boston Workers Alliance, which had uh, primarily um, built a built a lot of progress around um, quarry reform, criminal record reform to try and help people who had been uh, locked in the criminal justice system um, from being locked out of job opportunities. And so um, these folks started talking to each other and they started talking about their their own economies. It turned out that as uh, a lot of them Latino immigrants and uh, African Americans who don't hadn't always had venues for conversations like this uh, across their cultures, um, many cultures, uh, started, started understanding that they had a lot in common, that they were, had been on the losing end of uh, both capitalism and kind of progressive schemes and nonprofit economies, uh, which uh, I know in Boston, the nonprofit sector is strong and does a lot of great things in the community, but as an employer, um, hasn't had the greatest track record as an as a industry for for improving um, income inequality uh, or wealth building or even you know shifting who's making decisions at the tops of organizations and businesses. So these guys, in their starting talking, decided that they wanted to um, start their own business create their own jobs. Um, it was, it was, you know, in the Obama years and folks, folks remember uh, Van Jones talking about green collar jobs. Uh, and my colleagues were, were very interested in this idea and didn't see anybody else doing it. So they said, well, we'll do it ourselves. And very quickly decided that they wanted to be a worker owned cooperative. Uh, worker, worker ownership was going to be really important to them. You want to go to the next slide, Nick? Um, this is a, a, some quotes from a, a long uh, employee manual that has been written along with bylaws and articles in, in, of incorporation by the worker owners. Uh, that couple dozen um, and came down to 10. They met together for about a year. Uh, Nine months in, they uh, had received some grant money and decided to hire me as a general manager uh, in the fall of 2012. Uh, a year later, Cerro Cooperative was incorporated as a uh, Massachusetts Cooperative Corporation. But in the process of doing all that, uh, we went through a lot of co-op education. We went through um, teaching ourselves and nobody was getting paid for this. Everybody was scrapping it together. In fact, a lot, a lot of the uh, founders of Seto Co-op had been involved in the informal economy, in recycling, uh, from collecting scrap metal to uh, collecting waste vegetable oil and selling it for biodiesel. Um, but they still felt locked out of the ways of really building in these businesses. Uh, when biodiesel diesel became hot, uh, the big companies swooped in and took over all the opportunities there. So these guys decided they would build a co-op and they uh, got a small grant and they and together uh, we were able to start thinking about what kind of a business plan we wanted to do. And um, these were the things that, that bound everybody together, that we want to be connected with a local economy. We didn't want to be just a business, but a cooperative economy. Um, that we wanted to create opportunities not only for good, dignified jobs, but for worker ownership. Um, and that those 
jobs and opportunities would be affirmative in making sure they were provided to the people who lived in that community um, and needed those jobs. And um, we want to do this in having a democratic organization um, that that is both uh, collaborative internally and collaborates broadly um, in the world and in a solidarity economy. Um, again, leadership of people of color and working class backgrounds was going to be front and center. Um, uh, that we think that the way to tear down a white supremacist uh, dominated country is going to be to to put the people of color um, at the forefront. And so a lot of us white folks are also involved in this endeavor and we feel really good about that as well. Um, next slide please. Uh, here's sort of the, another way of envisioning this circular economy that we're working on building. Um, and this is the basic business concept. Um, I should tell you that uh, we learned in shortly after I started working with Seto in 2012, 2013, and we were writing our business plan, we learned that the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection was going to institute um, a, a waste ban that would require businesses of a certain size or producers, whether they're businesses or institutions, of a certain amount of compostable material um, would be required to divert and appropriately um, dispose of that material. What equals composting and appropriate is further to be defined, and I could talk more about that if you want, if anybody wants to hear about it. In any case, um, we thought of composting right away. Um, we knew that that would, uh, we, we learned a lot about composting and anaerobic digestion and incineration, and that taught us a lot more about environmental uh, impacts and uh, and it's it continued to look as though there were not only really really good environmental reasons to to become involved in this um, burgeoning infrastructure uh, that it would have a lot of opportunity and that it would be a good business opportunity. It also happened to fit skill sets of a lot of our um, members. Uh, we had folks who had been involved in trucking. We had folks who had been involved in working in um, uh, recycling facilities. Like I said, the informal economy, folks who had been collectors. Um, and folks in Central and South America where there's a lot more kinds of uh, environmental and recycling uh, systems that are decentralized and happening in, in lots of communities there. So um, we quickly landed on this idea of starting a hauling business and we would provide services to these entities, these restaurants, grocery stores, uh, hospitals, any place there's a cafeteria. If they were producing a ton or more a week of food waste, they had to start diverting that. Of course, other haulers were going to get into the business, but nobody had existing organic services contracts. Um, I think that those opportunities are all over the country right now. Uh, if anybody wants to start with a hauling business, I think that's probably a way, well, clearly a bunch of you guys are haulers as well. And before Seto started, we had um, a couple of residential um, composting efforts going on in Boston. Those were private businesses run by some entrepreneurs um, on bikes and stuff like that. So we we now collaborate with those guys. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Try to keep myself on track here. Uh, so let's get to what is a worker cooperative. Um, in terms of a legal entity, it's not a, a particular form of incorporation. Uh, we know co-ops who are LLCs, S-corps. We happen to be incorporated as a Massachusetts cooperative corporation. Um, it, uh, is a pretty straightforward way of incorporating and it's easy to find out how you can incorporate a co-op in your state. There's also a lot of really good regional, national, and international resources available for free about forming cooperatives. Um, and I'd love to hear from others in the Q&A if you're involved in co-ops to share your info too. Um, but uh, in a worker-owned cooperative, uh, there's a few key uh, elements to them. and that that members uh, invest 
uh, make an investment of their own. They have some form of equity in the game. Um, and that the ownership shares are only restricted in a worker cooperate co-op to to those workers. You can have members in other kinds of co-ops, but in a worker-owned cooperative, um, you have to be a worker to have an ownership share. Um, and it has to be democratically run uh, along the principle of one member, one vote. These principles are, are embedded in kind of cooperative agreements that have been um, around for decades and decades internationally. Um, and uh, surplus or profits that are earned through the worker cooperative are to be distributed to the workers. Uh, um, but it's not about so much developing individual wealth. It's about developing good individual livelihoods uh, for families in communities. But the business is never intended uh, to do anything but belong to whoever works in them next. When I'm when I'm gone as a worker owner no longer working, I will also surrender my ownership. Hopefully I'll take a few bennies with me. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I won't read all the way through this because um, I have a feeling we're probably going to be short on time. Um, but we have a board of directors. Our board of directors, according to our bylaws, must be dominated by workers, although we have a couple other community members, including a couple of the folks who were founders of the co-op but did not, uh, for their own reasons, become uh, worker owners, at least not so far. Um, and you can see there, there's, there's, this won't probably look different than other kinds of bylaws um, that folks adopt, but you go through a formal process to build this business and it makes you stronger as a group and more prepared to, to work together. Next slide, please. Um, and it's, there are challenges in choosing a cooperative model, um, not the least of which a worker-owned co-op, I have to clarify, um, uh, not least of which is financing, particularly for uh, uh, we're all low-income people, so our investment was all in sweat equity, thousands and thousands of hours of sweat equity. Um, doesn't generally impress a banker in a traditional institution, um, particularly when you convince them that you have a great idea and you have a great business plan and it's real tight and solid and the opportunity is there and everything lines up, but guess what? You're not going to offer any ownership, so venture capitalists are out. Um, like I said, it's an unfamiliar. Uh, the worker-owned cooperative is a less familiar model for traditional lenders, even if you can qualify yourselves um, as uh, credit worthy or whatever. Um, it's difficult. Yeah, it's, a lot of times you have to do a lot of education around being a worker co-op uh, if you're talking to traditional lenders. Um, and if you're, what you're doing is a startup and you don't have a business track record, um, that's clearly an additional challenge. Um, many cooperatives are created as a buyout or a chosen transition from a, um, you know, some other form of business into a co-op. It's a really great idea if anybody's considering that. I would consider that the easiest way. Um, this, is, this is beginning to change. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, in a, in a few minutes, but this was really, really hard for us. Brenda mentioned that we did uh, crowdfunding. We uh, developed a direct public offering and sold shares of stock to small, unaccredited community investors, most of whom who have never uh, invested in anything before, who have lent patient capital to Cerro Cooperative. Um, that's been a really good story. Uh, we also have a tranching system. I don't have a slide that describes that, but I could do another workshop um, where we've been um, working with a variety of new and emerging funds out there, including the Working World, the Boston Impact Initiative. Uh, I think there are local funds springing up. We actually didn't have a lot of luck with um, the PRI or the MRIs um, from foundations. Um, after a nonprofit got the original grant that did help us pre-startup, don't want to look a gift horse, but 
um, they gave that funding to a nonprofit who who passed it through to us. We didn't we didn't have luck because we still looked pretty risky, and we still do look pretty risky. Um, but there's some we we have raised three hundred fifty thousand dollars in in the DPO and crowdfunding. We raised another three hundred seventy five thousand dollars in uh, new economy style loans that again I could talk more about if anybody's interested. Ask a question about it. Um, and we are doing another round of financing now and have some other creative things coming along for that. Um, so I'm learning a lot about finance. Um, and it's very challenging in a co-op model in different ways. Um, another challenge is management. You know, you have to be very disciplined to think about accountability, to think about uh, group process. Um, it's probably true in any organization mm -hmm. or business to be effective, but if you don't have a hierarchy, um, you uh, you know you don't have clear lines of somebody who gets to make the bottom line decision. You have to. In our co-op, we um, have a modified consensus model, so we have to be really on top of our game with that stuff. Um, there's all kinds of learning curves in terms of learning to manage your own, run your own business. Some of us had certain amounts of experience. All of us are doing things that are new for us, as well as bringing gifts and skills to the table. Um, worker, worker owner education as an ongoing process is new. We've gotten a lot of practice at adding. We started at uh, five worker owners. Uh, each year, we've added two new full-time uh, worker owners. We're about to add two new drivers. After six months, they'll have the option to join the co-op. Um, so it's a it's a it's a lot of work, and you have the extra job of managing the company as well as showing up for your job. Next slide. Um, is it worth it? I think it is. Bottom line, um, it's why we chose it, and it's why we keep at it. And it's the most committed group of individuals I've ever been lucky enough to work with. Um, in our co-op, we have pretty good what we, what we think is pretty good wages. Nobody gets paid enough, and nobody gets paid too little. Uh, we all make twenty dollars an hour. Um, we also have health insurance for those of us who can't get it anyplace else. We have uh, dignified work, and we're very proud of our of Soto Cooperative. Um, we all have opportunities to learn. Um, we all have opportunities to lead. In fact, we're expected to do both of those things. Um, we're uh, building a business that benefits our community. Um, and that is not only about providing jobs, although that's really important. Um, there's faster ways to get jobs, but there's not better ways to get jobs, as far as we can tell. Um, and we want to build wealth. And when I say wealth, we want people to have uh, good livelihoods. Um, and, be, and be able to take good care of their families and, and have a lot of the opportunities kind of that a person wants for a, whatever good is considered to be. Um, and for, the, for building community wealth and, and creating the kind of change we want to see, being part of the kind of changes we want to see uh, socially, culturally, and economically, um, you know, it goes without saying, um, you know, making better jobs, um, folks know what the multiplier effect is that when you invest you know a dollar in a business in your own neighborhood and, it, and the person running that business lives in the neighborhood they're circulating that dollar uh, and it comes back to provide more resources for that community lifting everybody up um, and, um, and I Laura, think that developing time's up or let me just let me just jump in to remind people, sorry to interrupt Laura, this is Brenda. Uh, if you have questions, please type them in the, in the question box as Laura's wrapping up. We're going to have a few minutes for question. Laura, I know you wanted to show a short video. I don't think we have time for that, so we'll include that as a resource afterwards. And Don Hatch and Jennifer Gailey, you have your hands up. I don't know if that was in, inverted, but type your questions if you have them in the question box. And Laura, if you could wrap up in the next minute or so, that would be great. I, I can do that. Let's just click through the slides and see if there's anything I have to say. Okay, Nick, next slide. Uh, this is just that we have 35 customers now. Um, we're doing about 40 tons a week. Next slide. Um, you know, we've got uh, permanent zero waste jobs. We're um, What we do is we haul the compost 
to the compost facility and then we hold the composted soil back in to support urban agriculture. That's another part of the story I didn't get to tell. Next slide. Um, and that's the uh, what you'll see if you go to the home page of our of our website at cero.coop. Um, you can see this 30 second video which is our animated ad that's really cute. I'm done. Thank you all for listening. All right. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Eric. That was that was terrific. So um, I'm not saying a whole lot of questions. And um, uh, so, OK, they're beginning to come in. Um, and I wanted to take some of the business-related questions first, but um, I'm not saying a lot of those either. So we'll go to the questions we have. Um, so the um, first one is a comment from um, Elena. Elena, excuse me, in San Francisco. We have composting services included in our waste collection services provided through Recology. What are the benefits to creating a community compost project versus having our local government provide the service? So um, Eric, do you, if you want a response, I'll let you jump in, jump in first. Unmute yourself if you haven't already. Well, actually Brenda, <coughs> You're the one that should answer that. You're the queen of community composting. Go yeah. for it. All right. Well, um, and Laura, do you want to, before I jump in, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Uh, you know, government providing the service versus community composting creating? I don't know, Laura, if you muted yourself. Well, I'll, I'll jump in. At the beginning of this way by introduction, I, I shared with everyone our, the Institute's uh, new food waste uh, hierarchy, which we call Hierarchy to Reduce Food Waste and Grow Community. And in there, we kind of laid out, um, you know, reduce food, rescue, uh, home composting, community scale, uh, then more mid-scale, and then uh, kind of more centralized. So I do think that there's uh, what's really going to be healthy for any community is a diverse and distributed infrastructure. And, you know, I think one of the questions actually I had for Eric is this point, Eric, that you emphasized, you know, towards the end of your talk about that the role of government is, um, you know, really in kind of providing facilities and land and maybe setting the framework or policies and institutions and not actually, you know, funding funding it. and. You know, that could be a, a quite a, a interesting conversation to have. I mean, we're working in some communities where, um, you know, the local Department of Public Works, you know, are the city agencies that tend to have, you know, multi-million dollar budgets to collect trash, and we'd like to see some of that money diverted to supporting community scale operations. And, um, and often in communities uh, from uh, especially on the West Coast, we're seeing that cities like Los Angeles are creating these franchise districts and basically carving up the city, you know, multi-billion dollar uh, money going out to um, a particular, you know, one particular hall who has control over a whole, you know, uh, a whole district. And at the expense of small-scale operators not being able to compete for those contracts. So I think one of the earlier points you made is, um, you know, I think you used the example of the UK that an RFP can't be issued unless there's points for social value or social, you know, impacts. It would be an interesting one to explore, like what is the role, if government has so much money and they're spending it on trash collection anyway, why wouldn't some of that money, why wouldn't the community composting sector want to get a piece of that pie and government divert some of their money towards community composting? Why is it just facilities and policies? So is that your question is why wouldn't you want to take government yeah. money? Yeah. Yeah. Why wouldn't we okay. want to get a piece well, of that pie? Um, yeah. My short answer is, is that, um, and, and I have personal experience with county government, city government, state governments, is that the staff, they are not trained in business, they are not trained in composting, yet once they give you money, they feel like they have the right to tell you how you need to operate, <laughs> where your money needs to go. And all of a sudden, the, the creativeness, the innovativeness, everything that a small business brings to the equation, which is what a social enterprise is, or a worker-owned co-op, you're innovative, you're light on your feet, you're cost-effective, you're focused on your mission, 
These are all things the government is not. And so if there's some way you can get the money out of the government without them also having the power to tell you how to operate, then I'd say take the money. I just, in my career, over 30 years now doing this, I have yet to figure out how do I take their money, yet it also tell them, thank you very much for your money. Now go go away <laughs> and let us do our thing. Um, because and, and the government workers feel like they need to protect the public. And I think that's the discussion. What does it mean for a public servant to protect the public and to protect the tax dollars? We have to define that better so they can relax and let you do your thing. Yeah. Well, that might be. This might be a good topic for our upcoming forum in January, because um, we have examples like New York City of government that are investing in community composting, and um, and I think your points are well taken. So we have some more questions coming in. I know we're at the top of the hour, so for those of you who have to sign off, we understand that the, we'll stay on for another five minutes um, just to have a little bit of discussion. It will be recorded, so you can um, check back in. Um, on the recording and and, and uh, get some of the questions and answers. So here's one that's very specific to the business model. Have either of you heard of certified B Corp or benefit corporations for a social enterprise model? Eric? Yeah, um, I, you know the B Corp is interesting. I think there's potential there, but they're a little squishy. They're a little soft still. And um, I think that's why I like the L3C and the, the CIC model better. I do think the B Corp has potential, but I do think it needs to harden itself up so that uh, there's no shenanigans where people are just saying that they're going to fulfill a social and environmental mission, but they're not being held accountable. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, another question, I think uh, this one's for you, Laura. What is your pricing structure for hauling suggestions for no state local policy incentivizing food scrap diversion um, and low tipping fees so that's not um, let's a answer the first one first question first what is your pricing structure for hauling is that something you can share well it's um, it's varied but it's somewhere you know it has to do with how it fits into our roots and the size of the business and the frequency but um, we collect in 64 gallon containers and we arrive at per pickup prices and it generally uh, turns out to be anywhere between uh, six and nine cents a pound. Um, the containers tend to hold about 250 pounds. Um, we keep, we track weights uh, and, and pricing for everybody. Um, we make every effort we can to be cost neutral or cost saving for the businesses that we're working with. So um, a lot of the, uh, the bigger businesses have different kinds of, uh, it's not a straightforward structure, but it comes out to uh, uh, something that completely makes sense, so somewhere around between uh, $13 and $17 a total. Okay, good. How... Uh, another question, somebody else just related, Lord, to your um, operation. How are day-to-day -day business operations managed? Uh, uh, we have uh, developed some really good systems. Uh, we have our own database. Um, we use a mobile app. Our drivers use a mobile app, um, so we get real-time um, data. We can look on screen and see where our trucks where our trucks are at any given time and um, move routes around on a on a dashboard and inform drivers of new stuff we can collect photographs from the drivers at, at in real time during the pickup if they see contamination um, or some other concern it's usually contamination um, yeah. and we track uh, customer data uh, into like I said pickups, weights, um, a variety. Uh, th there's a whole bunch of metrics in our database. And um, if anybody wants to know more about it, we're happy to share stuff that we've learned in specific ways. So get in touch with me. I should have put up a slide with my um, email address, but it'll be easy enough to get to me. I'm yeah. Laura at zero. We'll, we'll, we'll share that. Um, 
a quick question. In addition to collecting from businesses, are you collecting from the residential sector? We are not so far. Um, we um, make referrals to, to pedal people, pedal power, and bootstrap. We actually pedal power is a Somerville based, uh, one of our cities that we serve. Um, residential bike collecting. Um, I think they might be a co-op. I should know that. And they um, they consolidate what they collect in their five gallon toters, and we do pickups from them. So. Uh, we have a little a little compost transfer station. <laughs> so, okay. So here's a out. here's a question for Eric. Um, Eric, where is the balance of requiring a social benefit from a social enterprise, and the business barrier such requirement represents? Well, <clears throat> what well, as a social enterprise that I built at EcoCycle, we always pursued at least a ten percent profit. Um, and that was very explicit with our customers and the government. Everybody we did business with, we were very upfront. We said, look, EcoCycle needs to make at least 10% on everything we touch because we're here to grow our mission. And the more money we make, the more mission we have. Um, so that was kind of our starting point. We sometimes made less and sometimes made more. But, you know, we had a threshold and we were very transparent and we were very honest with everybody. And I'll tell you, no government or big corporation like IBM, they all said, well, if you give me good service, 10% is fair. And that's how we proceeded. That's how we proceeded. Okay, good. Um, two more questions, and then we'll close the webinar. Um, uh, for Laura, can you elaborate more on the new economy style loans and perhaps point us to any relevant information and resources for funding community composting operations? Um, yeah, uh, I know less about resources for community composting operations. Uh, a lot of the money that goes in, we don't run the composting facility. I know that there are grants and funding available. Um, what I know about is mostly through the state. So there are, you know, DEP and also uh, Department of Agriculture um, grants sometimes that are incentivizing uh, that kind of work. Um, in terms of the, uh, the uh, impact investing, that's less related directly to composting um, and more related to people who are interested in this solidarity economy. In some cases, it's, uh, you know, people of wealth who uh, want to uh, invest with a conscience. It's the whole divest invest strategy. We're involved with a project. Here's a good resource that I would love for people to check out. Um, Ujima Boston, uh, the Ujima Project, if you Google that, U-J-I-M-A, it's one of the uh, Kwanzaa words uh, for collective work and action, I think, and um, or cooperative work. And we're working on building a, a local model of uh, what an alternative economy can look like. So, you know, where Eric was talking about sort of how the B Corps um, are aspiring to have values-based organizations um, on the local level. We're working on uh, building a local business alliance as well as uh, locally controlled investment that, um, again, is available one person, one vote, whether you invest a dollar or whether you invest a million dollars like, like Eric's model. Um, but this one is controlled by the community and the decisions are made democratically by folks who are coming together. So, so far we've done a bunch of events that we, we might Kiva a fundraiser and get, you know, $5,000 in a day because we have 100 people who want to take part in this and they, everybody gives in $5, some people give in 50. And we've been awarding small grants to small businesses in our own community, for example. But in terms of the, I think you're probably more interested in the ones that are making investment um, as I mentioned, the working world is probably the best known for uh, financing worker cooperatives. Um, they're based out of New York City, but they work all over the country and I believe internationally as well. Um, and then locally we have the Boston Impact Initiative. There's um, the Lyft Economy uh, out in the West Coast that has uh, put together a fund that um, 
I'm trying to remember the name of the fund, the Force for Good Fund. And what they're trying to do is create impactful businesses. Um, none of these are specifically um, funding comp community composting, but it certainly would fit the emission fit for um, any of the ones that I can think of. Good. Those are some I'll good resources. Um, so last question we're going to ask, and then we have just a quick poll. Uh, so those of you who are still on the call, we have almost 50 people still. Uh, please just stay on for another minute. We're just going to ask you what you'd like us to focus on for our next webinar. So we'd love your input. So the last question, and if you guys have any comments, try to keep them brief so uh, we could close the webinar. But uh, it's it kind of touches back to what we already mentioned um, about the franchise agreement. So here it goes. In the San Francisco Bay Area, and much of California, one of the many barriers to community scale composting includes franchise agreements essentially creating a monopoly. Does a capitalist system fail in waste management? And why do we need franchise agreements? So uh, Eric, I think uh, I heard you, um, you know, you talked about capitalist systems. Laura, you, you uh, didn't seem to have a problem. We throw out capitalism. so. Uh, does the capitalist capitalist system fail in waste management? Any any brief comments? Wow, I've I've been struggling with that for my whole career. Um, <laughs> when we're talking about a franchise, the franchise system in California, uh, that is you know essentially that's how government spends their money, how they organize the spending of their money to get service back. So that's what we're really talking about here. It's not capitalism, it's how does government spend the public dollars. Um, so let's remember too, California is probably the leading landfill diversion state in the country. So they're doing something right. Um, I think the franchise approach by government to spending tax dollars has a place. But I also think that it's not one size fits all. And it's government officials love it because it centralizes their power. And that's where we have an issue. That, that's where we small local uh, economy people like the ones that are here on this call, I think, I think that's where we can run into problems with a scale, the scale issue. Um, so that's why I'm so interested and I recommend watch how the UK is changing their government spending pattern through the Social Value Act because it's very possible then that a smaller private social enterprise can come in and offer more value for money than a franchise approach. Uh, but we're going to have to work at it because the franchise approach is a very cost-effective way for government to spend money and that's what we're up against. Yeah, good. So um, unless, Laura, you're biting at the bit to, to uh, uh, add to that, I think we'll just move into our uh, closing poll. So, Sounds good. Okay. So Eric, uh, thank you for answering that thorny question. Um, Nick, you want to just put up the last poll? Thank you all for, for those of you still on the call. So um, we'd first like to, we have a few questions, I think there's just two or three. Uh, how, after this webinar, how inclined are you to explore um, one of these business models? And the results are, okay, very, pretty high. So for the 46 people, we have 46 still on the call. I don't know if you all participate. That's a high interest. Thank you. All right. And then next polling question, what should our next community composting webinar topic be? And by the way, again, you can, if you don't see a topic here, we were limited. Um, you can certainly email us at, at, at composting, the number four, community at ILSR.org and let us know. So going once, twice, results. Hmm, spread out all over the place. Not a clear winner. More in depth on business models, one third of you. Okay, if you have other ideas, let us know. Um, Nick, do we have anything else? I think that's it. Um, oh, last question. Uh, how did you hear about this webinar? Just helps us um, know how you how you got to us. 
results other okay all right well thank you all especially thanks round of applause for our two speakers Laura and Eric thank you so much if you have follow-up questions you can also send those uh, our way we'll try to get them answered this webinar was recorded we'll be sending out a link to everybody who registered and uh, we look forward to hearing from everybody as a reminder uh, for those who joined late uh, we are um, uh, organizing our Cultivating Community Composting Forum in Atlanta in January and a full day workshop. So if you're interested in learning more about that, email us again at compostingforcommunity.org and we have a scholarship fund available to help cover um, cost for people to get there and registration accommodations. So uh, we are looking forward to hearing from everybody. So thank you to my staff and thank you presenters and everybody have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Brenda.